shot a ton of it in grad school. It's FKEY 100. Let's take a look at it and see if it's as fun as I remember. I wanted to do some more film comparisons to Tri-X like I began earlier in the year. But to keep things consistent, rather than do them every now and then, I went ahead and got 49 different film stocks, everything I could get in 35mm from B&H and Freestyle. So unless they were out of stock, I got a roll of it. Now if this part of the video seems familiar, it's because I'm using this portion of the video for all 49 of them rather than record it 49 times. So if you want to skip ahead to the H and D curves or the prints, time codes are right over here. For those of you that haven't seen this part of the video before, here's what I've done. So I wanted to use each film with the exact same shot, which is a headshot of me with a Kodak Gray Card Plus, which happens to have a red, blue, and green patch, a cyan, magenta, yellow patch, and then a dark and a neutral flesh tone. Then, with those shots taken, I bracketed every shot in third of a stop so that we can make sure we have a negative of equal shadow density to the base target film of Tri-X. Now, the reason I use Tri-X is because it's just been around for a long time and it's a very popular film. So it's a good base film to compare everything to. Then, once everything was developed, which was developed in D76 at stock for the manufacturer's recommended time, I printed everything on Ilford using the exact same aperture, contrast settings, developer, and everything. The only thing I changed was my exposure time, and that was to make sure that I compensated for any base fog variation from one film stock to another. Other than that, everything was left the same so that we can have a comparison of just the qualities of the film. Now there's going to be some uh, differences in contrast, especially on the high end, and that's because the manufacturers getting their development time may not have used the same target that Kodak used for Tri-X. And that's okay. We're not looking at the overall contrast for everything. What we're really looking at is grain characteristics, uh, tonality, how the film treats the shadows versus the highlights, that sort of thing. And uh, we're looking at spectral sensitivity, thus the gray card plus rather than just a regular gray card. So we're going to go ahead and look at H and D curves, which if you saw one of my earlier videos on sensitometry, I like to use pen and paper and make my graphs. However, my wife was really, really ready to make sure I was done with this project. So she put everything into a spreadsheet for you all. So even though I don't like them, I want to show them to you thanks to her. Then we're going to go ahead and look at the prints side by side with the same print made from Tri-X. And from there, you can decide if you like the film and if you want to go and use it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the curves and then we'll go to the prints. Tri-X once again in blue, the F-Key 100 in red. Now it's a little bit underdeveloped, so our line is not quite as steep as the Tri-X. That would be remedied with a little bit longer development time, but overall, it's a fairly good straight line. The shadow performance has almost an identical curve to Tri-X, so I think our shadows are going to be pretty much identical. And surprisingly, lower base fog than the Tri-X. The Tri-X was fresh when it was shot. The F-Key has been in my refrigerator for a few years, and we still have lower base fog than the Tri-X. So that's encouraging for those of you that have been hoarding this since Efke uh, stopped producing film. Uh, but let's see if the print actually shows us that straight line portion like we see here in the graph. Story time. When I was in grad school, I used PL100 exclusively. It was just my go-to film. Price was fantastic. It was easy to use, and I just liked the look but I kept having trouble with the 
retouchable matte surface being very inconsistent. It was all swirly. Sometimes on really smooth areas, it would just print out. And I kept looking for information online to help me figure out what was going on. Nobody else knew what I was talking about. Nobody was having this problem, uh, or at least maybe I just wasn't describing it well. And then inexplicably in the middle of a box, it just went away. The matte surface was gone. The swirls were gone. I didn't know what was happening. And again, nobody knew what I was talking about. Well, trying to do some investigation, I went through all my notes, my developer. I didn't mix anything up new. I didn't know what was going on there. It was the middle of a box with the film, so it's not like I changed that. Um, and then I realized I had changed my latex gloves to nitrile. Now, the box said it was powder free, but it was not powder free. What I thought was a matte surface uh, coating on the film was the cornstarch from my budget gloves from Harbor Freight washing off in the developer, getting on the film, and just kind of sticking to it the rest of the process. Sometimes we just make mistakes. All right, here we have Efke KB100 and Tri-X 400. This film was also renamed, relabeled, I don't know what, as PL100 in the sheet film, and that's what I used to use. Uh, I don't think there was any difference in the emulsion, and looking at the results, I'd say there probably wasn't. Uh, side by side, they actually look pretty darn close to one another. This did come out as a 100, so I got full emulsion speed from it. Uh, and while I shot a lot of it, I would say I never really looked at the spectral sensitivity before, so I'm really quite surprised to see that we're a little light on blue and a little light on red. Green came out exactly where I would expect. Um, although I guess if you really look at these two side by side, maybe green's a little darker? I don't know. Interpret that how you would like. The contrast is just a little flat. I feel like we did need to develop just a touch longer. Um, but I did not use D76 when I shot this all through grad school. Uh, I used ABC Pyro uh, and developed by inspection, uh, and that's a whole different story. Okay, so uh, overall, results are pretty darn good, um, and I do miss this film. Let's look a little bit closer and see the details and grain structure. Story time. Right after grad school, I got an artist in residence at the beautiful town of Breckenridge, Colorado. If you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. Now, I had a community project that I was going to do, and I was going to be shooting digital for that project, but I was going to be there for two weeks in the Rocky Mountains, and I wanted to get some of my own stuff done. So I packed along my 8x10 and my black and white F key film. Well, in an effort to do the best for my film, I decided to have TSA hand check my film so it wouldn't go through the x-ray machine. So the TSA agent is way down at the end of the line. I'm still being held up and frisked uh, like I'm going to commit some kind of crime on the plane, which I didn't. But I saw him down past the uh, x-ray machine and all that stuff take my box of 8x10 film, lift the lid, lift the other lid, open the bag, slip a piece of paper in there, and then close it back up, and I could do nothing about it. I got to the end, and I was like, dude, do you just open up my box of film? He's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it, I was really fast. <laughs> like a thousandth of a second fast, but what? So, box of film ruined. I get to Breckenridge, I have no film. So, I called my father-in-law, who we were staying with right after grad school, uh, and say, do you, do you have time? Can you go to the freezer? I've got a box of film. Send it to me, here's the address. The address is for the government, uh, the city government office that runs 
the program. Uh, we're provided an apartment space, but it has no mailing address, so it goes to the office. So a couple days go by, and I get uh, a call from the lady that's running the program, and she says, I'm so sorry. The package was delivered to you, but the person who received the mail didn't know your name. And before she realized what the program was for, before she realized you were in that program, she looked to see what was being sent. And she opened the box of film. And it's all ruined. Okay, so now I'm about a week into the program of my two week uh, residence. Not a single shot has gone by. Two boxes of film gone. Well, I call up my father-in-law again, and I say, I've got another box in the freezer. Send it to me fast. So he does. He overnights it from Kentucky to Colorado, and he writes on there, do not open. Do not open this box. <laughs> and it gets to me. I've got about four days left out of two weeks, and I am able to load up my camera and go out into the mountains and take some photographs. Finally. All right, here looking at the first section, we have a pretty good shot of the green structure on the background. If you're hearing a little bit of weird noise in the background, that is my wife and six-year-old son making a cake, and he is super excited about it. All right, the grain structure, looking at them side by side, I feel like they are the same size, but for whatever reason, the F key is a little bit more pronounced. How that works, I don't really know, but it's like it doesn't look grainier. The grain just looks more apparent. I don't know. <laughs> Take that for what that's worth. All right, let's look at the next section. Okay, here we are on the shaded side of the shoulder. You can see a little bit right here some of the weird defects that you would get with FK Film. The print itself is fine. I mean, it feels like a bunch of little things are popping up in this emulsion. And that may be from age. I never really used the roll film. I was always a sheet film user. And so I never really enlarged things up this big. And it could be that these things were there with the sheet film too, I just didn't make them big enough to see. I was making contact prints, so it didn't enlarge anything. That could be why I like the film <laughs> in the sheet size and not the uh, roll film so much. All right, here on the lightest side of the shoulder, the ribbed collar is nice and sharp. It is showing really good detail. I'm picking up a little bit of the weave pattern in the shirt that I'm not seeing in the 400 speed film but it's not as uh, nearly as apparent as in a lot of the microfilms that are in this series. So it's, it's decent performance. It's good performance. It's not out of this world, why is this film gone kind of performance. Before the price, my goodness, it was so cheap. I think, if I remember right, I think it was like $50 for a 100 sheet box of 8x10. It's unheard of. Uh, it, was, it was so fantastic. Don't have those prices anymore. All right, and here is the last section. We have good tonality through the face. The detail is picking up the pores and texture of the skin really well. The overall tonality, really beautiful. I do miss this film. Uh, if they brought it back, I would buy it in a heartbeat, especially if it were that same price, which I guarantee it's not going to be anymore. But overall, this is really, really a great film, and I, I miss it. So much like I miss my old Volkswagen Beetle, it uh, had its problems, but it was still just a lot of fun and I loved it. If you have your favorite film, I suggest you stock up on it because once it's gone, you're just gonna wish you had. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Thanks again for watching. If you would like to help support this channel, you can go to my Patreon page or my merchandise page down in the description. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next time.